So at Digiday, we cover basically what we think of as a historic transition between the analog era into the digital era. And for us, every single per person in the, in the media world, whether they're a brand, whether they're an agency, whether they're a publisher, has to get from point A to point B. And not everyone makes it, but every single business needs to do that. And a lot of times when we're talking about disruption, I find we talk about newcomers. And a lot of you are in startups that want to disrupt uh, legacy players. But we don't talk enough about people that have disrupted themselves rather than allow disruption uh, to happen to them. And that's why I'm very happy to have Jonathan with me to talk about the Getty story of how they disrupted themselves. So Jonathan, let's go back to 1995. It was a very different time. Yep. I was graduating from college. Uh, it, was, it was very <laughs> strange. I think I had an email address. You co-founded Getty Images. And it was, as Patty said, an yep. analog business. Completely. So tell me what the business was then. Well, um, the business then was completely unrecognizable from today. We had filing cabinets. Um, we had millions, literally millions, of transparencies. I'm looking into the audience, and I'm seeing faces looking at me and saying, oh, what's a transparency? <laughs> well, we weren't digital. There was nothing digital. Um, it was essentially a disorganized, customer unfriendly, difficult business. On average, it took a customer seven weeks to get a picture from the moment they called us, because there was no website, and said, I'd really like a picture of teamwork, and to the moment that they actually got the picture, licensed the picture, and used it. So it was a business with relatively small, you know. How many customers did you have, say, at two years in? After about two to three years, I'd say we had uh, 15,000 customers. We sold about 40,000 images a year. Fast forward to the second quarter of this year, we had 1.5 million customers. We sold 105 million images and were paid for them. We'll talk about paying for content later on, Brian. Yeah. You promised me I could talk about that. And uh, so the business has fundamentally uh, changed from those days. And it's evolved not just because of analog to digital, but also because of disruptive licensing models, disruptive ways to capture a picture, then to improve a picture, then to distribute a picture, and then finally to use a picture. In the old days, all the pictures were used in print, mm -hmm. and now obviously multi-platform. So when did you make the decision that you really needed to fundamentally change the business? On day one, one of the reasons um, we were attracted to this industry is because this was an industry with 19th century technology. It's called film. And it was an industry which was going to be so disrupted by technology and by an explosion of the need for our product. And we knew that people inside the industry were not going to be able to do that. We knew that they were terrified of what was coming. So what we needed to do was we knew that we needed to take this business we needed to professionalize it, we needed to consolidate it, and we needed to figure out how you could look for pictures online, and then after the internet came along, how you could actually sell a picture online, which we managed to do for the first time before anybody else in the late 90s. Okay, I just want to take a break here. We have a video we're going to show about, this tells the story of where Getty is today. It's just, it, it shows you how you can tell a, a story with pictures, and uh, you know, if, if it was a content summit, this I wouldn't have to do this. But just have a quick look at this. It was made by our Brazilian ad agency. It went mega viral, and uh, there's a little bit of sex in it. So okay. let's let's do it. With that, let's play the video.
So, I mean, we now have 160 million images, but that's not the point. I think the, the, the point is that the biggest change, I would say, in the last 20 years is that our industry, pictures and videos, were absolutely peripheral in all of the communications between people. Nowadays, imagery is what I often call the most spoken language in the world. The fastest growing websites, and I promised some people at Pinterest that I'd mention their name twice. <laughs> so Pinterest, who are also partners of ours, is the fastest growing uh, app or site on Earth. It's entirely a picture site. Snapchat is entirely a picture site. Mm -hmm. Mark, well, you, you couldn't have seen that coming. Uh, You're not no. that smart, right? No, no, we're not smart at all. <laughs> and we've been lucky on two or three occasions. We certainly didn't see that coming. But it's, it's, it's happened. Mm -hmm. And that is the way uh, the, uh, the whole generation now communicates. So, mm -hmm. you know, we've gone from peripheral to sort of the center of the conversation. What were the sort of big sort of secular trends that you were seeing that was happening when the internet uh, was really starting to take off that convinced you this is the time to really push disruption for our company. Well, we took the view pretty early on that the web lent itself to two particular attributes. The first is it lends itself to aggregation. So we knew that in 1999, there might have been 300 different sites selling pet food on the web, but in time, we would have to aggregate content and we would create a platform. And as a result of that, we knew that we had to invest in the platform. And that was, that was the first thing that was very clear to us, that we're a business to business company and businesses most precious resource is time. And if we can give them thousands of images and videos to choose from in one place with one set of business rules, we're likely to get more business. So that was a big risk. You know, we, invest, we invested in moving our business online at a time when Customers couldn't download pictures because there was only very, very slow dial-up. What were the keys to getting sort of internal buy-in that this was the way forward? Because, I mean, you're, you're talking about changing the direction of a business. Well, I always say, and I've learned this over 20 years, I certainly didn't know this at the beginning, that culture is absolutely everything in a business. And if you look at the companies who've been able to evolve, adapt, disrupt themselves, those are the ones who had a culture which was outward looking and, what was, and were prepared to disrupt themselves. And as I've often said, I would rather cannibalize myself than have somebody else cannibalizing us. So we, we always focus on change and the ability to change and the ability to ch challenge the status quo. We, we say to employees, if you do not like change, this is the wrong company for you because we we'll operate in an industry which is fully attuned to change. Secondly, we are, we are allowed to fail. We have, a, we have, a, we have a, a, a culture which allows failure, which means it allows experimentation. Mm -hmm. It allows trying things out. So I think you have to yeah. keep you know, saying that time and time again and then proving it with actions, because words are meaningless. So give me an example of a failure. An example of a failure? Oh, there's so many to mention. Um, <laughs> the only time that we've ever listened to investors, and anybody in here who's looking for investors or have investors, I have one piece of advice, don't listen to them. Because <laughs> the only time we ever listened to investors, they told us that we needed to go into the consumer market because we were B2B e-commerce, and B2B e-commerce had bad valuations, but B2C e-commerce was really hot, and so we needed to do that. And that was a big mistake. We, we bought a, a B2C wall decor business, and but in line with our philosophy and our approach to life, we knew within nine months it was a mistake. We shut it down. We, we took the pain and we moved on. And I guess that's the key is to, I mean, there can be, sometimes there can be ego involved uh, in which keeps companies from actually admitting that you're on the wrong uh, course. Well, that's another thing which is very Im embedded into our culture is that um, I'm very focused on telling the people who report to me, there are eight of them, Actually, there are nine, but one is very low maintenance. We won't <laughs> go into that. So there are eight of them. And I say to them, your job, very simply, is to make decisions. That's why you get the big bucks. Don't delegate those decisions to me. Your job is to make those decisions. And if you're making a decision, by definition, you're exercising a judgment. I don't care how big big data is going to be, but at the end of the day, you cannot get every answer through data. So you have to go with your gut and exercise a judgment. If you exercise a judgment, by definition, you're going to get it wrong, because no one bats a 1,000. Mm -hmm. And if you get it wrong, that's no problem at all, provided you've used the right criteria in coming to that. So, so 
we are constantly admitting that we're wrong. I, in fact, I lead the charge on that. You know, I, I'm so, wrong uh, already on a couple of these uh, answers. So part of this, the, the, the internal um, culture, is bringing in outsiders. Now, I think Getty is somewhat unique in that you've executed something like 200 acquisitions? Oh, not quite. About 135, 135 acquisitions of various different companies, collections, you know, stuff. So if you believe the sort of Harvard Business Review sort of things, 80% of, of mergers, of acquisitions fail, why have, I assume that 80% have not failed? No, we've had, we've had one of all of them that's failed. It's the one I mentioned earlier on. We've had a couple we've overpaid for. We've had a couple which didn't give us exactly what we thought we were getting. Um, but of the 130 or so, most of them have worked. And I think the reason that they work is, number one, we stick to what we know. As, as, as one a CEO once said to me, there's only one point in being the leader in your industry. And that's, you know more about that industry than anybody else. Mm -hmm. You're not going to buy something which is no good. You're not going to do a deal with somebody who everyone in the industry knows you can't trust. So you, you, you mitigate your risk by sticking to what you know. The next thing is that before we acquire anything, we have a full detailed plan to the last inch of what we're going to do with it. So we know exactly. Uh, what we're going to do, which offices are going to remain, which content's going to move to which sites, which photographers we want to lock up, which ones we care less about. Mm -hmm. we, you know, so so we, it's, a lot of it's in the preparation. And then the final thing is we teach people about the company's culture very, very early on. And we say to people, this culture may not work for you. But that doesn't matter. It doesn't make you a bad person. It just means you won't, you won't fit in here. So we're very much you know, focused that way with the acquisitions and the integrations. So is Getty a media company or a technology company? Um, I think you know, Getty is both. I would say that, that if I look at my head count, we've got 2,000 people. Of those, 700 are in sales and customer support. About 500 are in technology. So we're a bit of both. And then we have hundreds who are actually creating the content. We then have non-employees, uh, contractors, partners, 250,000 photographers and videographers around the world. So they're the key to the business too. So I would say we're, we're a bit of both. I once was asked this question before and I said, we sit at the intersection of media and technology and uh, the interviewer said, most people who sit in the intersection get run over. <laughs> and it was like, uh, yeah, so I don't say that anymore, but we're a bit of both. I would say our culture deep down is of a content business. Mm -hmm. We have a content culture. So content is at the center. So you feel strongly that intellectual property is something that should be respected, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it seems like the images business has a problem in this and that not a lot of people do respect the intellectual property of images. I think you're right. I think um, if we go back to the beginning of the web, at the beginning of the web, the only thing that you could easily transmit on the web because of bandwidth constraints was words. And they were largely free, and then your world figured out that you, know, you might, might have paywalls, et cetera. The next thing was music. And music sort of screwed the pooch, if that's the right um, description, for other IP on the web. Until iTunes and Spotify basically made it easier for people to pay very little or nothing at all than to steal. So mm -hmm. humans don't really like stealing. But what about the technology platforms that possibly enable that? I mean, Napster obviously enabled yeah. the stealing of music. And I think in, in the images case, you could argue that Google is uh, yeah. facilitating the theft of images. So what we've done is two rules that I always have is you don't stand in the way of, of customer behavior, and you don't stand in the way of technology advancement. So what we saw with the sharing economy that there is and the number of images that are shared every day, we took the view about seven months ago to make our images free. So images from Getty Images can be embedded for free. So as one of the speakers yesterday at another stage said, provided you're not using those images for commercial purposes and making money out of them, you can use them for free. So today, we've got about 60 million Getty Images images that you can embed for free today in your blogs, Facebook, share it, et cetera. And that embed feature works. We've had a, you know, in seven months, we've had a billion views and it's growing like crazy. People like pictures. Our problem, and, I, and it's something which I don't expect a tech audience to necessarily be sympathetic, but to quote Bill James yesterday on his panel when he was talking about people who disagreed with him, don't talk to people who disagree with you because you're not going to change their minds. Talk to people who are open-minded. The bottom line is that the search engines are going away from their original purpose, which was to, 
to send you to a place where you could transact and are essentially trying to keep you there longer. And when it comes to music, they're still prepared to send you somewhere else, Spotify, iTunes, and um, you want to buy a toaster, they'll send you somewhere else. But for some reason or other, when there's an image, um, a number of them have made it extremely easy to steal that image. You click on the image, it gets bigger, there's no attribution, there's no link back. Um, in fact, some companies, one of whom we're suing, Microsoft, actually have a, s a system which is it's basically how to steal, one, two, three, steal. And um, <laughs> we, we, we don't like suing our customers, but we do believe, and you know, spending a day and a half at this conference when everybody's talking increasingly about how important content is, and our content is important for engagement and content marketing and all the rest of it, we do believe that that pendulum is swinging in the direction of the content owners and creators. The photographer in Iowa or in Dublin who needs to be paid for that image in order to pay their bills and to frankly survive. So we're seeing a movement in our direction. We're patient. Um, I get a better audience for this in New York than in Silicon Valley. But then 10 years ago, Silicon Valley had no understanding of content. Now they're actually in the business of licensing content. You know, Apple and Netflix are media companies that you know, they weren't in the past, or right. at least they're enabling media. So, um, but after 20 years, you know, we're very patient. We just press on to the next 20 years and um, we'll get there. I cannot see a world where you know, intellectual property is free and we just rely on the advertising. Excellent. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Thanks, Brian. Yeah.